Welcome. <laughs> I'm Christine Elder, and we're celebrating International Vulture Awareness Day today. And so why do we have a day for vultures? Well, because a lot of people don't realize so many of them are threatened with extinction. And so we'll talk about some of those species today and some of the threats. In this presentation, you'll also learn about the characteristics of the two families of the world's vultures. And then I will lead you in a detailed step-by-step -step drawing demonstration of a beautiful species of old world vulture called the Egyptian vulture. You'll be able to follow along by downloading the vulture sketching cheat sheet that you'll find in a link below this video. Okay, let's get started. So vultures have been revered as symbols of power and messengers of the gods for thousands of years. I want to start right off with some of the threats and then we'll go over some of the species and then we'll do our sketching demonstration. As you probably know, they are misunderstood, maligned, vilified, poisoned, and hunted. So I'm really impressed with you guys for being here today um, for uh, liking vultures and wanting to learn more about them. Okay, so of the 23 vulture species in the world, 16 are considered either um, in the categories of near threatened, vulnerable to extinction, endangered, or critically endangered. Vultures uh, live all over the world, but they're most endangered in Africa and Asia. They're uh, doing okay here in the new world. Um, and uh, some of them are coming back from extinction like the California condor, but they face lots and lots of threats. And so um, here's a few of them. Um, many die by eating poisoned uh, varmints. So uh, lots of people will uh, set out bait for things like coyotes and, and such uh, things that are either competing with their livestock or getting into their crops. And so they'll leave those poisoned things out um, and then the vultures will die from that. Uh, they also die from what they call sentinel poisoning by wildlife poachers. So especially in Africa, where poachers, um, people are illegally killing things like uh, elephants and rhinos. Uh, once those animals are dead, uh, vultures will smell that and they'll start circling. They'll smell it or see it and start circling above. And so a lot of times the vultures, uh, I'm sorry, the poachers will shoot and kill all of the vultures uh, so that they don't act as sentinels to the wildlife uh, game wardens trying to protect um, the, uh, the game. Uh, another uh, major thing that happens in several uh, African countries is what they call belief-based traditional killing. And uh, I just found this amazing article uh, in this great uh, um, online uh, magazine called mongabay.com. It was about uh, vanishing um, African vultures. And it was written by a gal who graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz science writing program. And um, I, it thought that was interesting because I graduated from the science illustration program at UC Santa Cruz. Anyway, so because vultures appear mere moments after creatures die, many Africans believe the birds are clairvoyant. People can assume those abilities by ingesting the bird's brains, eyes, tongues, um, according to traditions. So uh, that's a lot of the problem is people um, poach these birds and sell them at these markets. They are also killed as bushmeat. Now, these are just generalized images. These aren't uh, vultures, but, you know, a lot of places in the world, there isn't enough food for the 7 billion people that live on this planet, especially uh, in um, Africa and Asia. And so uh, animals are killed as bushmeat and sold in markets. And, you know, that's actually one of the uh, ways that we think uh, COVID-19 may have come into the human population is live animals in what's called wet markets, as well as dead animals can spread disease. Uh, and so this happens with a lot of other species that we've studied um, in the last couple of years. If you've uh, taken other classes with me, like pangolins uh, and rhinoceros, so another way they die is collisions with wind turbines. And so a lot of uh, a lot of birds that are migrating, a lot of birds migrate at night and they can't see these. And these turbines are incredibly huge. These 
these, each of these blades can be, I think, something ridiculous, like 100 feet long. <laughs> and um, so when these are up and there's dozens of them along the crest of a mountain, uh, there's just about no way that migrating birds can get around them. Eileen, yes, you're talking about Ebola. Yes, there are many, many diseases that have come to us from wild animals, especially from these wet markets. Uh, and there's an amazing book um, called Spillover that talks about that. Uh, a lot of the major zoonotic diseases, including AIDS. Another way is electrocution on power lines uh, because so many vultures are really large, especially uh, the California condor, this was an issue for, still is, that they, um, they uh, roost on these high voltage lines and if both of the wings touch different lines and they're not insulated properly, um, the bird can be instantly uh, electrocuted. And uh, another uh, way that is common also in the um, our California condor on the Pacific coast is death from ingesting lead bullets. So hunters uh, will uh, kill game and then often just leave it for one reason or another, or maybe they'll just take the antlers um, and uh, leave the carcass. And so if it has lead bullets in it, um, that can be deadly to them. And unfortunately, there are alternatives to lead bullets, but not um, all uh, hunters are uh, behind that. Unfortunately, it could be an easy fix. <laughs> And then another huge one, especially in Asia, is the ingestion of veterinary uh, NSAIDs, uh, and especially this one called uh, diclofenac. So a uh, very uh, alarming number is um, between 92 and 2007, 99% of India's vultures died. So thankfully, there have been some uh, changes in uh, laws regarding this veterinary drug in those areas, but now it is uh, being used more in other areas of the world, including Europe. Um, yeah, and so this is a picture of this uh, vulture with its head drooping, and that's one of the first signs that it um, has ingested this. And so these drugs will be given to uh, uh, sickly uh, livestock, and then if they die um, and are left out in the open, um, the vultures can, can get them. So this was a huge issue, uh, and it still is in many parts of the world. Okay, habitat loss, of course, is another one for all types of animals on this planet that are trying to share it with us 7 billion humans. Uh, not the habitat loss, of course, you're losing uh, uh, biological diversity, you're losing your um, natural uh, prey, uh, as well as um, livestock, <laughs> and um, you're losing loss of nest trees. Uh, and this is also included the climate change, right? <laughs> So we all know um, the effects of climate change lately, especially here, well, actually really all over the world right now, but we've got terrible fires in the um, Pacific Northwest. Okay, yeah, and then, um, so why? Why are we worried about losing vultures? Aren't they just one other species? Aren't there 10,000 other species of birds? Well, there's been incredible studies proving um, that when you're losing so many vultures, like 97% of them in India, then carcasses build up. And then when carcasses are left out, other animals can feed on those like feral dogs. And then the feral dog population explodes. And then there's a decrease in diseases that can be communicable to humans like rabies. So anyway, moving on to uh, happier subjects, so let's just get going down back to uh, characteristics of vultures, and then we'll look at new world vultures, old world vultures, and then we'll draw our Egyptian vulture. So um, what unites them? There's, there's actually two major groups of vultures. They're in different families, um, the family that is in the new world and the family that's in the old world that we'll go over in, in a bit. But basically, they're very important as nature's um, recyclers and scavengers. So they're going to be cleaning up all the carcasses. And if those carcasses were going to be laying around, uh, of course, like we said, they could uh, transmit diseases. And so they're, uh, they're moving food up the food chain, right? 
Uh, they have excellent sight and or sense of smell, depending on the species and their habitat that they live in. Uh, generally, they've got very bald heads, although as Eileen said that um, the Egyptian vulture uh, has a bit more uh, feathers closer to its head, but often that head is bald all the way down the neck. And that does help to keep it clean from all the, um, um, you know, putrid flesh that they're, you know, when they're sticking their head into a carcass. They have extremely strong stomach acids that digest the putrid prey and neutralize all the toxins and other diseases that and parasites that could be in that uh, decaying flesh. Uh, they're pretty heavy bodied, generally kind of hunched over stance. Like if you think of the, um, you know, a Halloween version of a, a vulture, uh, usually pretty broad wings and a stiff tail for soaring because many of them um, can soar and circle for hours and many of them uh, uh, take on long distance migrations uh, for um, moving between their uh, wintering and their breeding ranges. And they don't have much of a voice. You know, they're not in the songbird group, so you're not going to hear them making any songs. Uh, they just kind of have grunts and hisses. <laughs> So um, here's a, 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 some examples of their heads. Like Aileen had pointed out, uh, you know, some have more feathers than others. And so you can see a very uh, bare head uh, in this California condor. And it's really cool because you can see here the actual ear opening. A lot of people forget that uh, birds can both... Um, um, not only see, but they can hear with this hole that you generally don't see. And here's the other hole uh, in this other species. And then they also can smell, obviously. And some species smell better than others, especially some of those that live in more forested um, environments where they can't see the prey um, on the forest floor, but they could smell it. So here um, are their nostrils as well. And they generally have a pretty big, um, strong beak. And um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's keep going. And here's a, an, another one, uh, just kind of showing different styles of heads. And you've got some, um, you got some of the feathers here. And sometimes they have this interesting uh, ring of feathers that looks like they're kind of wearing a, a fuzzy, uh, what do they call that thing? A boa. <laughs> Okay, and like we said, their body characteristics, often they're really broad and heavy. You know, they kind of look like a, a raptor. And in fact, the old world uh, vultures are in the group that's with the other um, raptors, exhibitors. Okay, so a little bit about their behavior. <laughs> so here's that hunched over stance we talked about. Um, so often they'll sit for a long time up on a perch way high up so they can see and smell uh, what's going on around them, um, noticing uh, if there's been, say, a, a lion kill of a gazelle and if they're going to hang out and wait for the uh, hyenas and, and lions to finish with it. And so there's some interesting names with groups of vultures and what they're doing. So um, when they're hanging out around a carcass, when there's a group of them, it's called a wake. And here's a lappet-faced vulture at a, a skeleton. Um, so like I said, a lot of them migrate long distances and they have um, groups that they call kettles that circle. Uh, I've seen these kettles in Texas and South America, Central America. So they can soar effortlessly for hours in search of carrion on thermals. And when they do that, that group is called a kettle. So they have a few different names for the groups. You know, often you'll have names for a group of uh, animals. Um, like a school of fish, but vultures tend to have a few different names. So a kettle is where hundreds or even thousands will be circling, um, riding those thermal thermals like raptors. And they can, yeah, they can migrate many, many long distances to follow, um, you know, a, a very unpredictable uh, food source, which is carrion generally killed out, killed by other animals. 
And here's another name for a group of vultures. So often vultures like these turkey vultures you're probably familiar with will uh, sit around and they're called a committee. I just love those names of groups of animals. Okay, and then um, in terms of behavior, uh, many of them are monogamous uh, and they'll build very large nests. Sometimes they use those for several years. Uh, some species will uh, nest in trees and some will nest in cliffs like this Andean condor. Okay, and so starting here at home, I know some of you or many of you are here in the new world. And so that's um, North and Central and South America. So these guys are all in the Cathartidae family. Um, and that comes kind of from the word um, uh, catharsis, uh, which means like to clean or to purge. And so uh, I think that's related to them being uh, cleaners um, of the world's uh, ecosystems in terms of recycling carrion. Now, again, um, as we go through uh, these groups, tell us uh, if you've seen each of these species. All righty. So we only have uh, seven here in the New World. They're definitely much more diverse in Africa and Asia. Uh, and here's another great behavior here we, we see. You might be familiar with them. As they're sitting in this committee, they're going to, especially in the morning, they're going to be warming up their wings or if they've gotten wet um, from dew overnight, they're going to um, hang them out open, uh, which is very characteristic of um, vultures. So we've got the turkey vulture. And uh, again, here we see cathar today comes from cathartis, meaning purifier. So the turkey vulture. So who's seen the turkey vulture? <laughs> so quite widespread. Um, and it's the uh, vulture that comes the farthest north in the Americas. It's in North and Central America. Oh, Kat, thank you very much for sharing the Birdorable um, resource. Yeah, lots of resources and cute gift ideas. Okay, and then the black vulture, uh, aptly named, completely black, and they have this really uh, kind of interesting uh, head here that's all bare. And uh, this one you see um, in kind of Southern North America and then down into Central America. And these guys will often uh, soar. Um, no, what am I thinking of? No, I'm thinking about the hawk that often soars with vultures. What is the name of that hawk? Anyway, okay, moving on. Sorry, my ADHD is getting to me. Okay, and then there's the, um, the uh, yellow-headed uh, vultures, and that's a pretty obvious color pattern there. It's kind of rare, a um, little bit similar to the Egyptian vulture we're going to draw today. Here in this one, you can easily see the nostrils. You can see right through the nostrils, and you can see the ear here as well. You can see a lot of vultures um, will have a light colored bill and um, so they're lacking melanin. So some of them, you know, they uh, it's not as strong as a bill that would have a lot of melanin in it. Uh, and so, you know, they're hopefully not needing that bill as much because uh, melanin does strengthen the bill. Um, so uh, raptors, especially that are really using that bill to tear through stuff, um, a, a light bill like this wouldn't be as good. Anyway, moving on to the California condor. So um, completely uh, a, a bad name for it because uh, it ended up, um, well, it used to be all across North America, all the way over to Florida uh, during the Pleistocene. And this huge wingspan, right? Up to something like nine feet across. And you wonder why it would have um, be so large uh, because most of the prey animals are a lot smaller nowadays. Uh, and it just happens that, you know, it was really successful uh, during the Pleistocene ice ages where in North America, you had this huge megafauna, like the big woolly mammoths and all the other very large mammals that it could dine on. And so, you know, some species that are sort of relictual species, we call them, were sort of more well adapted to a, a, another time and another habitat with different um, animal prey. So they don't have as much prey now. Um, 
as we mentioned before, uh, they are affected by electrocution uh, and by um, on, on the high power lines and collisions with turbines and also um, uh, poisoning from the lead bullets. And here's one that's marked here. Uh, so they, they're, they were all across the United States and then their numbers became less and less and less from these um, uh, threats until there were only, I think about 20 something left. And uh, um, conservationists and bird biologists uh, got together and decided that it was best to collect all of those and to bring them to a breeding facility to try to bring their numbers back. Uh, and so that's what they did. And actually a girlfriend of mine works with condors every day. It's so fun to see her uh, posts on um, social media. She gets to actually hold them and release them and capture them and study them. And unfortunately we lost some during last year's fires as well, because many of them uh, nest down in uh, the Big Sur area and farther south uh, in the coastal uh, range, the Redwood range, and some of those areas burned very badly. But um, there is good news, you know, they are coming back. And here's a cute picture of how they feed the babies with these uh, very interesting uh, uh, hand puppets so that they don't get imprinted on humans. So now a whole bunch of them, I think we're up to around 400, and um, many have been reintroduced to the wild, not only in California, but in Arizona, um, the Grand Canyon, and... Uh, uh, I believe soon, if it hasn't already happened, uh, the Columbia River Gorge, uh, just north of where I live. So they are listed as critically endangered. So it's a good thing that um, there's a lot of groups uh, working on them. Okay, going farther south, the king vulture, aptly named, I think, because he's got this beautiful coloration, the most brightly colored, I'd say, of all the vultures with a beautiful snow white body, and then this very interesting slate colored neck, and then multicolors on the head, and you may have sketched this one with me. Tell me in the chat box if you sketched it. Um Oh, Heather, they're releasing condors in Baja. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think a good place to go uh, learn more about what's happening with them is the uh, Ventana Wilderness Society, I believe, is one of the main groups. So anyway, King Vulture, I did a sketching workshop on these guys last year. Uh, so I've been lucky to see these in, um, where did I see these? Central America, um, Guatemala and Honduras, especially I remember seeing these. The Andean condor. So going farthest south, the farthest south uh, is the Andean condor that lives up at the uh, very highest parts of the Andes um, all along those ridges. And I've seen them in Peru and I've seen them in Ecuador. And I was uh, lucky to uh, see them and sketch them with this, um, with my friend Jose Ianis, who uh, is actually a native of the Amazon uh, lowlands, um, one of the native tribes, and now uh, has worked for almost 20 years for tropical birding tours. And uh, we're up at Antisana National Park, and uh, these are the cliffs that we saw the condors nesting in. And I saw some in captivity. Do I have another picture? I saw some in a captive breeding uh, area in Peru. And it was amazing when they flew towards us and landed nearby to feed. The, the sound of their flapping wings, you know, this, this like nine or 10 foot wingspan, I think, flapping, it just sounded uh, just amazingly strong and, and, and huge. Um, oh, good. LA Zoo is raising them. Yeah. Thanks for chiming in, everybody. I can't learn everything here. But anyway, yeah, here's one. Um, here's a picture of how they nest in these very steep cliffs. <laughs> and here's one uh, flying. So yeah, I was in Antisana, which holds the largest population of them. And of course, you can go see them with folks like uh, Tropical Birding Tours. Okay, moving on, um, like we said, new world vultures were in one family, only seven of them, but here are the old world vultures. So here's uh, most of the rest of them. Most of them are called vulture, but a few of them have special names like griffin, 
um, the Griffins, and uh, the Lammergeier, which is a really cool one. Okay, so kind of two different areas, um, although there's a lot of migration between for some of these, but vultures of the Middle East and India. So, um, so like I said, uh, several different vultures that lived in India um, have their numbers have dropped by over 90% basically almost extinct. And it's um, largely due to that uh, veterinary drug that they ingest from um, the dead carcasses of livestock. Uh, so this is the Indian vulture. Here's the white rumped vulture. Sorry, I don't have a picture of his rump. <laughs> Critically endangered. The Himalayan griffon. Oh, Griffone, near threatened. So these are categories from the um, uh, cities, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the Red List, as we call it, Cenarius Vulture, also near threatened, kind of has this interesting uh, bluish tinge to the skin. The red-headed, it's also called the, uh, I believe, the Indian black vulture, critically endangered. Here's a few vultures of Europe and Africa. So the Eurasian griffon, least concern. So um, it's not like we're really not concerned about it, but that's um, that's the category of endangerment. So it's doing pretty well. And um, I was actually lucky enough to see this one uh, when I was, hmm, I spent my 50th birthday in Italy and spent about three weeks traveling around, I went to Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. And this was in, I believe we are in, Cis no, this was Sardinia, I believe, on the coast of Sardinia. Uh, and so here are some very steep cliffs and you can see they're all whitewashed. And the birds were very tiny. We are very far away from them. So this is not my photo. But anyway, it was really cool to, um, to see them. And we did see a couple of them flying in and out. So a lot of uh, vultures in Europe will uh, migrate back and forth between Europe, especially Southern Europe. There's the most species of um, uh, Eurasian vultures are um, spend the winter in Spain. And then they go south across the, often the Straits of Gibraltar uh, to uh, Africa to breed. Here's the white-backed vulture, critically endangered on a giraffe. Here's the bearded vulture, also known as the Lammergeier. And you see they've got a really interesting beard here. Do you notice that little fluff of black there? And they've got kind of some interesting peach colors. But, you know, most vultures are kind of what we call pied or black and white with, um, you know, a little bit of other colors uh, mixed in between. Critically endangered hooded vulture that kind of looks like it's wearing this little wool cap or hood. The lappet faced, and that's this, um, these uh, pink uh, fleshy structures are known as lappets. So there's lappet faced vulture, endangered category. So you see so many of these in um, Africa and, and um, India are involved, um, are endangered from many of those uh, threats that we mentioned earlier, especially the, um, the veterinary uh, uh, drug that gets into uh, livestock carcasses, but also from persecution and um, the bushmeat trade and all those other things we mentioned earlier. Upel's griffone, critically endangered. Now, speaking of a naked head, that one's naked all the way down to its, uh, its uh, white necklace there. The white-headed, which could actually be called the pink and blue-headed. It's got these really pretty uh, colors on it. Critically endangered. 
So each of these species kind of faces different um, different threats or sometimes maybe a, a lethal combination of all of those threats we mentioned earlier. Okay, and so the Egyptian vulture is the one we're drawing today and um, it's listed as endangered. It's also known as Pharaoh's chicken and it was venerated in ancient Egypt for its role as a scavenger. A pharaoh would punish people with death if they killed an Egyptian vulture, and the bird became known as Pharaoh's child. So um, it's it's also uh, poorly named, just like the California condor. It's not just in Egypt, but that was where it was first uh, venerated. It goes from North Central Africa over to um, up to Spain and Eastern Europe, and then over to India and kind of all the uh, countries north of India that end in Stan, like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kirkmenistan, all those places. Um, they're quite migratory uh, in the north of their range and the ones in the south don't migrate so much. Um, so their habitat is, you can imagine those places I mentioned are quite arid, steppe lands, desert scrub. Um, they'll go into pastures and cereal fields, uh, but they really need um, rocky cliffs for nesting. Uh, they are monogamous and they build large nests in trees from about March to May. Now, what else about these guys? Um, yeah, so they have they have declined over 50% in the last 30 years. Now they have this unique coloration on their head, this uh this yellow and then you can see they kind of have a crest. They have a crest that they, they can kind of raise and lower this kind of fuzzy um and then this unique purely yellow head. Um, and then their, their feathers, uh, they're kind of black and white, as we call, said, the term for that is pied, P-I-E-D, a bird that's black and white. And it kind of resembles, um, almost resembles a, a gull, a seagull, <laughs> a gull, um, or sometimes a stork kind of when it's flying. But you see, it's got those broad wings and that broad tail. Uh, and again, remember these guys, all the old world vultures are in a different family from the new world one. These guys are in the same vultures, as, um, same family as excipiters. So a lot of the, the other hawks of the world, they're in that family. And these guys are threatened by um, strychnine um, poisoning and pesticides, poaching, um, also electrocution and shortages of prey of both their native prey because of habitat loss, but also um, of a loss of uh, livestock, uh, wind turbines, as well as uh, feral dogs. Now, something interesting, some, another interesting thing about these guys um, is they're really opportunistic. So they're not quite as um, uh, just uh, uh, dependent on, on dead animals or carrion. They can eat a variety of other live things. Uh, so uh, they can, um, eat to, um, yeah, other, uh, other live small animals. Um, small mammals and, and reptiles and, and amphibians and things. Well, not so much amphibians because they usually live in a drier environment, but a unique thing they can do, and I wish I could get a picture of it, but I've heard about this, is they can use tools. Um, they will pick up a stick and drop it on an ostrich egg. Uh, now, I actually have an ostrich egg in the other room. I could show you a friend of mine brought back from Af Africa. They're huge. They're almost as big as a football and very heavy. So it's hard to break into those with their sort of weak bill. So they're um, one of the only animals to use tools, one of the only birds. And yeah, it's it's um, it's said that they can uh, uh, pick up a rock and drop it on the uh, ostrich egg. Isn't that cool? Rosemary says, what are the vultures weight? Well, they really range. Um, these guys are the smallest of the vultures that are found in Europe. And um, uh, there's only four that are generally in Europe and these are the smallest. Um, now I think it's a, there are a few pounds. I'm sorry, I forgot um, how many. Let's see, but I did write down, um, yeah, they lived up to 30 years. So anyway, they live, of course, in 
in uh, Egypt area, but also up into Spain and parts of Europe, um, this part of Eurasia and India. So that's where they're located. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are moving on um, to sketching them. So who's ready to sketch? Tell me if, again, if you're new here, please tell me if you're new in the chat box, because uh, many of you know all about my concepts of thinking about uh, relative proportions, of looking at angles and alignments and negative shapes. I talk about all of those things in my courses too. So, you know, there's basically two things to think about when drawing. And basically you can draw anything in the world if you work on these two things. And one of them is really just understanding the anatomy of your creature first and how it differs from um, ones that are uh, related to it um, and ones you might see sympatrically in the same habitat that you could get it mixed up with. Um, and so that's one part of learning how to sketch something is just really knowing what anatomy to notice and make sure you draw correctly. Uh, the other part, of course, is the drawing part, the hand-eye coordination um, and the observational skills. So, so much of it has to do with just seeing. Um, you may have heard about people that um, don't have any hands or, or feet and can just draw with maybe a, a pencil uh, between their toes or even paint that way. People painting and drawing with just um, their uh, mouths with a pencil in their mouth. So, you know, you don't have to have perfect hand-eye coordination. It's more about really observing, going slowly and looking at something detailed and, you um, you know, your abilities to draw more realistically happen um, the more you practice, right? So it's a lot of it's about practicing. Okay. And again, like I said, um, I'm going to demonstrate, you know, the outline that you can follow along with me. And then I'm going to also demonstrate kind of adding some of this other stuff that you might not have these tools, but it's fun to watch anyway. Again, I'll have a soft sketching pencil and a charcoal pencil. Um, I kind of pulverize those on some sandpaper and then I rub it on with either a Q-tip or a fingertip or, a, or one of these smudging tools or a paintbrush. And then, um, then I really love using these really narrow erasers. Uh, and that's how you get some of these little tiny squiggles here that I've used. And then you can see how I made a black background so that the white feathers uh, stand out. Okay, let's get going. Who is ready to sketch? So again, I always start out just spending a few moments looking at those field marks, this beautiful snowy white uh, head feathers, the yellow head and the beautiful rust colored eye, the ear, the nose opening, uh, the big bill, uh, the black bill at the end, which is strengthened by melanin and the mouth. So yeah, the longer you look at something first, uh, the easier it will be to sketch. So I'm going to start out with just kind of this arc. Of just the top of the head very lightly because we we're going to make all those feathers separate later and we're sketching with just a feather like touch so you can barely see okay and then um so we just kind of did the upper and lower arc of the feathers now i'm measuring the length of the head and where the head kind of starts where the yellow part of the head starts behind the ear and again, staying very loose, like you're just tickling the paper very lightly, noticing the height and the width. And I'm gonna give you a close up here on the left so you can see it even better, probably better than your handout even if you printed that out, depending on how big your screen is. Just placing the lower part of the, the unfeathered head and the upper part of the forehead. See, I'd, I'd gotten it a little bit tall, too tall. So no worries, you just keep working on it. And if you started super lightly, you don't have to spend much effort erasing. Okay, we're gonna spend our time on the head and do the feathers later. Noticing the bill comes almost to the edge of the paper there. 
going to do the arc of the top of the head here. It's kind of really steeply angled. Well, no, more like a shallow angle. <laughs> and just looking back and forth at that arc of the bill, the yellow part of the bill, the black part of the bill. And how strongly arched that top part of the bill is for digging into its prey, its carrion prey, or sometimes an ostrich egg. I like to always double check with my looking back and forth, ground truthing. We had the little wispy feathers behind there and now we've got the stronger yellow bill and then the black the black and yellow demarcation there and the melanin strengthened black part of the bill arching very strong and fierce <laughs> like a raptor again these guys are in the accipiter family shared by the other raptors many of the other raptors of the world. Now that nice arc of the mouth, the closed mouth, and noticing how far back it goes all the way, drawing all the way back to the opening of the ear. Yes, Milan, it looks quite fluffy. So birds have muscles attached to their feathers so they can move them up and down. You know, just like uh, Milana, when we get goosebumps, and that's the same sort of muscles in our skin that are raising the hairs on um, our forearms. And that's how we get goosebumps. So birds can do the same thing to keep themselves warmer if they want to, especially when it's cold. The bird will fluff up its feathers. Double checking the depth of the upper bill. And where that mouth ends, double checking my, decided I had it a little bit, wanted to get it a little bit arced down. So it's never too late to, to fix things. So always just double checking, looking back and forth. Now, of course, this is a more detailed, meticulous drawing than we would be doing in the field. But um, inside my courses, I teach people how to do much more quick, like one minute or five minute sketches in the field. Now the lower bill, and that's got a little arc to it. And then it ends in that wrinkly, skin of the face. It's kind of hard to tell because the bill and the skin are that same yellow color, but you can see at the base of the bill where it starts to get a little wrinkly, that's where the skin starts and the hard part of the bill ends. And that lower part of the bill, there's two parts to it, a left and a right side, and there's soft skin in between under the lower part of the mouth and the tongue. And I'm kind of drawing that area right here, right now, in the shadows. There's that skin that's between the left and the right halves of the lower bill. Okay, anyway, we'll work on the white feathers more later. Gonna finish up with the back uh, end of the head now, and then the eye and the ear and the nose. Always doing a lot of double um, checking and ground truthing, especially in the beginning. I don't do this so much when I'm sketching nowadays, but to, to kind of get you guys in the habit of really making sure that you're um, returning again and again to your, um, to your photograph or your live animal, as the case may be, and making sure you're really drawing from observation and not from memory or imagination. 
just really wanted to get the arc of that bill correct. <laughs> And I could even probably get a little bit longer, which I think I do later on in my final drawing. You see, it goes a little longer. But, um, you know, we can just get the major outline. And then when as we're shading with the graphite pencil, we can modify things a bit. Okay, let's add that big nostril. Kind of a big elongated triangle there. And you see how it's kind of shaded on the upper part of it. The, the upper left part of it is in more shadow. So it looks like that's where the sun is coming from. Sun looks like it might be about noon or maybe about 10 a.m. <laughs> coming from the upper left. Take care, Pranj, y'all. Come back for the sketching workshop. Okay, now we're placing the eye. Of course, the eye is the window to the soul. So we want to spend quite a bit of time on getting this right. Double checking how tall and how wide it is. It's not a circle, so it's a little bit um, longer than it is tall. Really making that eye look quite open. Although, you know, of course, birds can close their eyes a bit. So if yours is a little narrower, that just means the lids are closed a bit. But try to get it pretty open and aware and awake. That makes the drawing look really interesting. And then the closer you get, when you feel like you've really got that shape, that oval shape, then you can start firming up that, that outline. And then they've got the actual eyeball is inside that fleshy area. So it's a little bit more circular with some dark edges. And then there's a pupil. And in birds, the pupil is round. You know, in some animals, like some mammals and some reptiles, it's not round. But in birds, it's round. So it's got that black and there is a highlight we're gonna to wanna to leave on both the black pupil as well as the beautiful kind of burnt sienna colored eye. And we'll work on that shadowing more um, after we get everything placed. But I kind of like to get the eye in a little bit early when I'm doing a drawing. It just makes me feel like the animal is alive and looking at me and waiting for me to finish the drawing. <laughs> okay, and then now um, the edges of the eye la um, eyelashes, not eyelashes, um, eyelids, sorry. So there's a very obvious crease above and below the eye. And then a bunch of other wrinkles on the forehead there. He's got lots of worries, this guy. He's worried. <laughs> worried about getting poached, probably. So he's got worry uh, wrinkles on his forehead. And I'm pointing with my uh, other extra pencil to try to help me keep track of all those wrinkles. Because it's easy to get lost a little bit. <laughs> So if you have a second pencil or just your finger and you can kind of point at the area you're drawing. I will also use a small viewfinder. You've seen me do that before. Viewfinders that have uh, maybe just a hole uh, that's maybe a half inch large. Depends on the size of your drawing. And I like to cover... Um, a certain area with the viewfinder. So I'm just looking at that one little half inch square. And again, I demonstrate that in my courses. Now we've got that ear that we got shadowed there. Again, it's really easy to think, forget that birds have ears. Now the, the mouth ends and then the wrinkly part continues into the um, edge of the ear. So there's a whole bunch of wrinkles in there that will uh, continue to define in our shaded pencil part. But we're just getting the gist of it now. 
especially if you don't have time to stay the whole time. So I'm just keeping track. And of course, these wrinkles don't have to be exact as drawing one nose and one ear and one eye, right? So every animal, just like us, has wrinkles. I'm noticing a lot more wrinkles on my hands lately than I used to have. So every individual has different wrinkles. So those don't have to be as perfectly exact as maybe the length and shape of the bill and the size of the eye and those other more diagnostic features. And I'm just double checking here. What am I doing? Just playing around. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm just kind of noticing, yeah, these hairs kind of start on the side of the bill and then go up and they go kind of directly up and then they arc around. And again, this doesn't have to be exact either because the bird moves these depending on its mood and its temperature. They use feathers for communication, just like a mammal might raise its hackles. A dog might raise its hackles if it's scared or, or, or mad. But you see, in general, there's a way that the feathers are sort of going up and then, you know, kind of at like two o'clock and then noon and then 10, nine, eight, seven, six, and then down under the chest back towards, yeah, 2 p.m. or something. Okay, how y'all doing so far? We're getting pretty much the outline. And we see, again, I'm just trying to show there's a, these sort of V-like shapes where the feathers are raised up in light and the um, there's shadows below them. So I was kind of doing that. You could spend like literally an hour sh shading these exactly it perfectly. So I'm going to let you do that on your own, but I will... Uh, continue a bit here and then um, continue on with shading more the the face and such. What did I notice? I was trying to fix something here. Sorry. I was looking around. Double checking everything, helping you guys catch up if you're behind. Just looking, I'm spending time looking back and forth between my subject and my sketch. Okay, so now we're going to go back, let me see, and getting more details of the face here. So I've giving you a, a larger face to look at again. So this is the last time we're working on the face since we got the feathers sort of placed. Looking at that shadow of the ear and there's kind of a, it looks sort of like an ear flap. <laughs> and then that top of the, there's a bunch of little white hairs sticking out as well. So I'm doing a little bit of stippling sort of to show some of those wrinkles and hairs. I noticed that the, the top of my yellow part of my bill could be a little bit more of an arc 
But again, that can all be modified as we continue on with the shadowing. So this outline right here is just a basic template to get you started with the shadowing. So we've shadowed the upper left edge of the, of the nose, showing just how deep that cavity is. So here I'm showing a value scale that I make. I'm just going to hold that up there just a minute. So a lot of times I rec recommend that, you know, whatever medium you're using, whether it's a pen or pencil or watercolors or anything, that you uh, create a value scale. So that just means that trying to go um, um, equal steps, as many steps as you want to make, and this is zero, meaning the white of the paper, and the four is the very darkest you can make with your chosen medium. So if it's a charcoal pencil or a black ink pen, it's going to be a lot darker than a 2H pencil. But still to see that, that you can make a range of values and then start to compare that, to look at that and um, try to emulate that with your, with your drawing. So even within the white feathers, there's a lot of different values, zeros and ones and twos. And the bill is twos and threes and fours. And the eye is threes and fours. And again, the feathers have a range of values showing that they're lifted up and there's shadows underneath. Helps make them more three-dimensional. Okay, so I think, are we ready to go on to the shading? And once we're done with the sketching, we will share. We do that at the very end. Because not everybody can stick around the whole time. So I like to try to get the sketching done. Oh, I'm noticing that don't watch your palm. So once you start shadowing, especially if you're using really dark um, carbon or charcoal pencils, you want to be careful that you're not smudging. And so you can either start drawing um, from left to right if you're right-handed like I am, um, or you can put a piece of uh, clean paper under your palm to uh, protect the drawing from your palm. So I'm just uh, working on the head now then from left to right. And noticing how long, relatively how long the feathers are. They get pretty long up at the top of the head. And those outer ones are raised up maybe a couple inches above the, the actual skin of the bird. So you see some pretty... Um, interesting shadows, as well as some kind of cream colored feathers at the top of the head. So yeah, however you want to do that. I'm I'm playing with um, holding my pencil kind of horizontally to get some of those shadows. You know, you don't have to hold your pencil as if you're writing words. You can hold it overhand and use the side of the pencil. Lots of ways you can do that. And here, you know, you don't have to be a slave to reality. Uh, 
I know that I definitely get a little flustered when I see areas like this that are repeating, <laughs> like drawing a pine cone or a pineapple. <laughs> so I'm going back to the head now. <laughs> and you can, I'll spend a little bit more time on the feathers, but I like to kind of skip around. I guess it's my, my, um, my history of field sketching and you kind of never know how long your um, animal is going to be sitting there in front of you. So I try to continue to work on the whole piece and not completely finish one part at a time. I know sometimes you see these uh, sketching tutorials on YouTube and they start with the eye uh, of a human or something and they completely finish that and then they move on to the nose and the mouth and I'm, I'm just not that kind of an artist because I'm more of a uh, natural history biologist type. I'm used to sketching in the field and and thinking my my subject might fly away or run away at any moment. So I try to just work a little bit everywhere. And if I'm lucky that they are still um, posing for me. <laughs> okay. Bye, Milana. We'll see you next time. You can share next time. Monday, maybe. So with any kind of pencil, you can press hard or soft. So even with a very dark shading pencil like this, I think this might be a 6B, you can press very lightly for light values and then you can press uh, harder for darker values. But I'm trying to get this bird looking alive with some interesting patterns in the eyes and you see some highlights of sort of the sky and trees in the upper left. Make sure you leave a little white circle inside of the black pupil. That helps to make it look alive. So keep referring back to your, your vulture image. And think detailed drawings like this can seem really intimidating, but if you just go really slowly and part by part, and again, sometimes if you if you cover your drawing and just have one part visible using like a one inch square viewfinder, um, that can help a lot to simplify. Folks like me that are really strongly ADHD you have a hard time focusing on one thing at a time <laughs> as any of my friends will tell you and probably most of you can tell me so I do tend to skip around which is good when you're out in the field <laughs> but again I don't mean for you to be exactly following every stroke I'm doing here the is just the concept that you can see that it takes quite a while a lot of people stop right when it starts to get close you're usually going to want to spend at least 10 percent more time on something than you think to get it really realistic really three-dimensionally rendered so even on this black part of the bill here there's some different values there's a little bit of highlights from the sun and then there's some other areas that look kind of scratched or kind of parallel lines. And you can do a combination of, of drawing lines in and then lifting them out with that narrow pencil, I mean, a narrow eraser that I demonstrated earlier. And pretty soon I am gonna make that bill end longer because it definitely needs to be a little longer but it could have broken off on this bird <laughs> too from wear and tear so the more you know about a bird's uh, biology and behavior um, and anatomy the more you know how how closely you um, need to draw something to exactly what you see like for example humans just about always have two eyes and two ears but they have vastly different lengths of hair and colors of skin. And even within one person, 
in one year or even one day, uh, parts of their face can change. So same thing with these guys. So the more you know about them, the more you know how important it is to get certain structures exactly as you see them and other structures you can have more, um, you know, artistic license, I guess they would call it. But it's not really artistic license. It's, it's just as much, you know, understanding the biology of that animal. So that bill, you know, is not a complete sphere. You know, if you were looking at this bill straight on, it would have some kind of ridges and wrinkles to it. And so just noticing those highlights you see on that black bill, that bill is, you know, several values of kind of from a whitish and it kind of slate, slate blue to towards black. And the more you can work on your color vocabulary, the, the better it'll be for you because you'll, you'll see something more accurately. Be able to describe the colors like this, this yellow of the face. It's not just yellow like a lemon. Uh, you know, there are various shades of kind of green and orange and And the eye, you wouldn't just call the eye brown. The eye is a very beautiful, warm, uh, what I'd call burnt sienna. So you might have noticed I had that very narrow eraser in there. So at a certain point, I start kind of going back and forth between using a pencil, using a blending stomp, and lifting some values with my um, my mono zero point eraser. Here I am using it flat handed or overhand. Some people are better at that than others. Sorry, that mouse of mine is always in the way. <laughs> So here I am using the blending stomp, but you can also use, can use a tissue or a Q-tip. Pretty much everybody has a Q-tip at home. And that's nice and small to be able to bring with you in your field sketching bag. So I'm trying to blend things so I don't have too many actual lines unless they're really strong, like those wrinkle lines or the lines of the uh, mouth. Now, at a certain point, when you get enough graphite on your, your blender, sorry, is my name, I can't tell if my name is in the way there. So I'm using that blending stomp on its side to give me some shadows, which is super fun. And also I can dip that blending stomp in some pulverized uh, graphite or carbon or charcoal and draw with it as well. So you can think of the blending stomp as really another drawing tool, also known as a tortillion. See some really short, fuzzy white feathers on the edges there. They're kind of overlapping the cheek. And there's some shadows underneath the bill. Giving some special, some extra love to that eye. You 
You see, once you really start adding in all these three-dimensional details, which I don't usually go this far in depth in these sketching tutorials, but I just couldn't help myself. This vulture was so cool. It becomes really an iterative process and you're just continuing to, to finesse and modify by drawing and blending and lifting. I'm gonna use the side of my pencil. You can see some kind of grayish green tinges behind the nostril and under the eye and shadows in the ear and under the bill. more wrinkles and more little fine white feathers. Rhea, yeah, you can use a soft brush. Yeah, I actually, I actually have a, a few different um, brushes. I like kind of stiffer, like acrylic brushes, um, you know, so not really soft like watercolor brushes, but it, it kind of depends. Um, yeah, and I've done some other demos where I show that. So yeah, I didn't show that here, but if I'm doing a full on illustration in carbon dust, like I've shown you guys with pangolins and tardigrades. <clears throat> yeah, you can, um, you can put the carbon dust that's pulverized on the sandpaper onto your drawing with um, a very fine brush. Yeah, and I might start with a very soft brush to do that, but then to kind of darken it and set it more, I'll have some other types of brushes. Um, and maybe some flat, both flat and round brushes. Yeah, so just... Yeah, sorry, I'm getting into my right brain. I'm starting to like draw along with it. <laughs> you can also turn your drawing upside down and that helps you to see the shadows better. In this kind of finished version, I spent about maybe about 10 more minutes on this. And you know, it's not a it's not an ornithological illustration by any means, but I just had some little bit more fun with adding some some a greater range of values, right? So yeah, you know, I was just trying to give the idea of three dimensionality to all these uh, hairs and not necessarily share, show each of them. But you know, you certainly could see that easier. Again, if you turn your paper upside down, it's easier to see the shapes of these shadows if you felt like you had to get those exact. <laughs> but it's more important to see these and also turning your drawing upside down. Okay, well now, <laughs> yeah, so now uh, you're probably not done, just like I had fun continuing on, and, and I hope you keep drawing. So I uh, hope you have a good rest of your weekend, and keep finishing up on that sketch. I'm going to keep finishing on this version. I think I did about three of these. Uh, okay, well, thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.